so that, that success story that we have between Part C and D plans especially and community pharmacy needs to be replicated, not only between community pharmacy and all of these other measure sets, but also other areas of pharmacy. So like health systems pharmacists, like what can health systems pharmacists be doing in their respective settings, um, using data to inform decisions, especially in real time, to help support patients and to improve the, the measures that matter for those given health systems. So, uh, other care settings. Welcome to the Pharmacy Quality Solutions Quality Corner Show, where we believe that quality measurement leads to better outcomes. Let us become your go-to source for all things related to quality and medication use in healthcare. We will hit on trending health topics as they relate to performance measurements and find common ground for payers and practitioners. We will discuss how the Equip platform can help you with your performance goals, and we will also make sure to keep you up to date on pharmacy quality news. So buckle up and put your thinking cap on. The Quality Corner Show starts now. Hello, Quality Corner Show listeners. This is your host, Nick Dorich, and we welcome you to the PQS Quality Corner Show. We have one more episode that's going to tie into heart health for you today as we look at quality measures and we discuss how it can be applied to cardiovascular disease, wrapping up our series on American Heart Month. We will be taking a global view of quality measures in that sense because cardiovascular disease and management uh, it has such a large impact on the population as a whole. Now, if you haven't already, please check out episodes 12 and 13 in this season. Uh, those are titled How Community Pharmacists Can Support Transitions of Care for Cardiovascular Disease and Understanding Clinical Guidelines for Patients with Cardiovascular Disease. Both episodes talk about the importance of communication between pharmacists, providers, and patients in order to optimize medication use with the ultimate goal of improving outcomes for patients with cardiovascular disease. But now we're going to go ahead and jump into today's conversation and allow me to introduce today's guest. That is none other than Dr. Sam Stolpe. And Dr. Stolpe is the Senior Director of Quality Measurement at the National Quality Forum, or NQF. Sam, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks, Nick. It's really a pleasure to be here today. I'm excited to jump into this. Of course, I want to touch on a bunch of things related to cardiovascular disease and how it ties into to measurement, heart health overall, but a bunch of other topics that we can talk about as well. Excellent. Sam, before we do that, let's start with hearing about you and the National Quality Forum. Um, while we could talk a lot about NQF and how it works uh, to me for measures, developing standards that are critically important for the foundation for initiatives to enhance healthcare value, make patient care safer, and achieve better outcomes. That's one piece of the pie. Um, but let's hear from you. What is your background? What's your background in pharmacy? And tell us a little bit about NQF. Oh, thanks, Nick. Okay, so I'm I'm a pharmacist and uh, epidemiologist by training. Of course, my biggest point of pride is the pharmacist part. So I'm delighted to be able to jump on this show and talk a little bit about how how we're tying together things around healthcare quality measurement and uh, how that pertains to the profession of pharmacy. Uh, for me personally, I, I cut my teeth out of pharmacy school doing a fellowship at the National Association of Change Drug Stores, which Nick, you're very familiar with. You followed right on my heels. <laughs> um, at NACDS, I, I got involved in some research and demonstration projects that uh, I didn't know would be the gateway drug to the healthcare quality measurement world. <laughs> But it really ended up being a passion of mine, starting to work on measures around primary medication non-adherence and learning more about how the quality measurement space really just uh, got me very excited. I went to work at uh, the Pharmacy Quality Alliance directly following my fellowship at, at NACDS. And uh, from there, I did some work inside of, of some technology companies, one that I helped found, another that's related to uh, public health and eventually made my way over to the National Quality Forum, which you asked me to give a little bit of background about NQF, and I'm happy to do so. NQF has been around for 20 years, followed right on the heels of two seminal um, pieces of literature in the quality space to err as human and crossing the quality chasm, when the country was really uh, facing some really huge challenges associated with figuring out how we deliver better care at a lower cost and uh, resulting in healthier populations. NQF is uh, focused on healthcare quality measurement science and uh, really sits at the nexus of some 
interesting intersection points of healthcare, uh, especially focused on making sure that we're measuring the right things, that we're doing it in a responsible fashion, that we're um, wading into this nation's science of healthcare quality measurement in a responsible way that's both keeping uh, fair measurement practices going into place for providers and getting actionable information in front of consumers to make the right kinds of healthcare choices. So I'm, I love being at NQF. I've been there for about, I've at NQF for about two years now and I've really been enjoying the role. Thanks for that introduction, Sam. And I, I would add, it's very exciting to hear about folks like yourself, pharmacists that are being tied in and are, are working as part of NQF, right? The sign that pharmacy is playing a bigger role, has a bigger role to play in the larger healthcare ecosystem. Now we will get to today's questions and the content for the show. And before we do, let's give a quick overview of what comes next. There are three questions written down for us to explore. I'll go down the list and ask the first question. Sam, you're then, you're then going to have the chance to respond. We may have some back and forth to summarize the key points. We're then going to repeat that process for the second and third questions that I have, and then we'll wrap up the recording. When we get to that end, we'll have a exciting and fun question at the end of our episode. But let's go ahead, let's jump into question one now. And for our first question, let's start with the big picture. We're eventually going to get to cardiovascular disease and quality measures, but let's start with the 35,000 foot view. And Sam, you have said it yourself and your background here, you're a quality improvement advocate. You've worked with numerous organizations and a number of roles involved with the quality improvement process. You're also a pharmacist and you've spent your time dispensing medications on the front line. When it comes to quality measurement, why is it a passion for you? And for our pharmacist listeners, why should they be caring about quality measurement? Yeah, th those are some really important questions. I, I think uh, the main reason that it, it's become a passion for me is I've, I've seen how how gaps in quality can result in really serious consequences or potential uh, risk for uh, additional consequences for the patients that I've cared for myself, uh, being in the trenches, wearing that white coat, and the inside of community pharmacies. And I'd actually like to say, share some anecdotes related to that, to that if we get some time to. But, but why should pharmacists care about quality measurement? You know, pharmacy as a profession has, I, I won't say has been largely exempt from healthcare quality measures because they're, they're definitely here. They are, they're not knocking at the door. Healthcare quality measurement is, is sitting inside of, of our living room on the couch eating our Cheerios. <laughs> we, we, we have this as part and parcel of everything that we're doing inside of uh, providing care uh, as pharmacists today on the daily. Now, that being said, there's still a larger world of healthcare quality measurement that presents a, a enormous opportunities for pharmacists uh, not only to, to contribute and to help other players in the space to, uh, to reach goals that they share in common with, with pharmacists, but also just to continue to demonstrate our value and ensure that our profession is keeping up with the overall direction that the healthcare is going inside of our country. So one thing that's become increasingly clear to me is that our country, this nation, is currently engaged in what I would characterize as the largest value-based payment experiment of all time. Uh, we've, we've got a tremendous political tailwind behind this. Both parties uh, see this as just the direction that we need to go, that fee-for-service, this unsustainable growth in costs associated with providing medical care, it's, it's just not something that we can do forever. And so it just begs the question, how else could we do it? How else can we structure payment to ensure that we're getting value out of healthcare if you know, the, the fee for service promise is uh, not delivering on what it should? Uh, it just means that we have to go in the direction of using quality measures as a way to determining when we are seeing value and, and evaluating costs at the same time. And, and that's really gonna get us to where we're going. Now, I use the word experiment to characterize what this what is actually going on inside of the value-based payment world. And I mean that word literally. We don't know the extent to which certain things work. We're learning lessons about it. So some things are standing out, but we're also trying a lot of new things. There's pockets of innovation and in emerging, and there's some areas of healthcare that are getting better at this than others. But the question has been put to pharmacists, like where can you contribute in this area? 
And there's still plenty of opportunity for us to do it. And let me, let me just describe a couple of other salient features of the quality landscape related to this that you know, the listeners might find interesting. And I'll just give uh, one big example that um, undoubtedly many, many of the listeners are familiar with, and that would be uh, the Medicare Shared Savings Program. So SSP, as it's called, was, uh, was rolled out as part of the Affordable Care Act. So 10 years ago, we started this a journey to understanding what it would be like if these accountable care organizations, which are uh, voluntary groupings of providers, usually under the auspices of a health system and a series of outpatient clinics and the like, um, takes responsibility for a population of Medicare beneficiaries for a period of two years. Now, there's a, a number of different tracks inside of the shared savings program that allow for variation in risk, that's assumed. But there's one thing that we have learned about it is that it does work. What happens inside of these shared savings programs, ACOs, is that they need to do two things to share in savings. One, they need to demonstrate savings. <laughs> and then two, they need to perform on a series of healthcare quality measures. Like currently inside of the SSP measure set, there's 23 measures. So I, I mentioned this. The big question is, does it work? And the answer is, well, yes and no. There's there's some signs that are, are uh, producing some good results. So let me just give in, in some, a couple of statistics on this because I think it's fascinating. So in, from our 2018 data from, for SSP, about 500 health systems participating nationwide, 11 million beneficiaries, average cost per beneficiary right around $10,000. Net savings, average savings per beneficiary, $100. Well, right around that. So we're talking about like 1% net savings. So the question is, well, is this program really generating the sort of value that you want? So, well, we're still learning a lot of lessons. And the, the whole story isn't there inside of the summary statistic. There's a range uh, of savings by, uh, by these health systems, and some of them are, are netting a loss, like a loss of up to $1,600 per beneficiary on average in some of the lowest performers. And some of the highest performers are saving you know, $3,000 per beneficiary. So that's a 30% savings uh, over what the average is, which is phenomenal. So why is it that some of these ACOs are able to assume risk and to do very well, and others attempt to do the same and perform very poorly? And uh, so I think that there's a lot of things that we can learn just anecdotally. And moreover, there's a lot... Uh, of ways that pharmacists can impact, and maybe we can get into this a little bit more, what's happening inside of programs like the Shared Savings Program and how appropriate medication use management can feed into better quality and savings overall. Sam, that's a, a great point. We'll, we'll use that to transition to our, our next question here in just a second. As you pointed out, that average savings of $100 you know, dollars per patient or, or 1% of net savings would point out, and I'm sure uh, that 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 had that this is pointed out, that is still a savings, right? That, that That is to some extent, no matter how small, an improvement on the program. But a part of the quality improvement process is going to be how we work through information sharing and how we educate others so that those savings continue to generate more savings with the program. Now, let's with that, let's transition to our second question and use of quality measures uh, for, for some programs. Sam, you've stated it, quality measurement in healthcare, it's not going any, it's, it isn't going away. It's gonna be staying around for quite a while. It's further ingraining itself in the culture of healthcare and quality measures are used in a number of different programs. And there are various quality measures for health plans, for health systems, for different types of insurance coverage, and of course, for different providers as well. So there's a lot that we can cover. But I want to try to break it down for pharmacists and for pharmacy as a profession. Is there an area that exists now where if we're going to be looking into our crystal ball of success going forward in the next 10, 15, 20 years, where can pharmacists contribute positively to improving patient care and where can pharmacists have a strong focus on quality measurement? Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a great question, Nick. And I actually think it ties really uh, tightly back to what we were just talking about. And um, to your point, you know, like 
hundred dollars per beneficiary. That's still savings, especially when we're talking about eleven million beneficiaries. Now we're talking one point two billion dollars. Um, yeah, that's, that's significant. There's a big story there. And uh, to the other question that you had here, which is how do pharmacists actually get tied into it, and where are the real opportunities? Um, yeah. Shared savings program is a great example. Um, we've had some really great success stories uh, early in uh, pharmacy's introduction to working with healthcare quality measures in this cascading effect that you know one accountable entity is looking to uh, to leverage partnerships between themselves and pharmacy uh, to achieve a commonly held goal related to healthcare quality. And uh, the way that we've seen this manifest the most for pharmacists thus far in, in our story so is uh, with Medicare Part C and D plans being held accountable, especially to these medication use quality metrics, that they really see an opportunity for a community pharmacy to contribute to. But as you just pointed out, that's not the only quality measure set that's out there. In fact, uh, you know, CMS, and this is just the federal government, not trying to <laughs> suggest that they aren't the largest payer in the U.S., but, uh, but CMS administers over 30 uh, pr such programs for health systems, for ambulatory care settings, for post-acute care settings, and of course, at the population health level, it's not just CND. We're also looking at the quality rating systems for the exchanges. There's uh, a, a bunch of measures that are used for the adult and child core sets for Medicaid, and within each one of those sets, invariably, you're going to find measures that are sensitive to pharmacist intervention because they will deal either explicitly with uh, appropriate pharmacotherapy or implicitly because so much of what it goes into finding value in healthcare is around the management of chronic disease. And anyone that says that, that the mainstay of <laughs> chronic disease management is not appropriate medication use doesn't understand how we approach modern medicine. That's that's just how it's done. So with that being said, there's a lot of measurement opportunities for pharmacists um, when we're thinking about how do we get outside of Part C and D? How do we start making contributions to other commonly held measures that might influence the overall performance of someone that isn't just a health plan? That could be like a health system, as you mentioned, or or inside of a post-acute care setting, like how, how you can actually influence the measures that matter to those entities. So the big part about that is just as starting, uh, getting started with, with awareness, with familiar, uh, getting familiar with what those, me those measures might be. And maybe we could spend a little bit of time just looking at, uh, we mentioned the shared savings program, but I did want to draw attention to some of the medication use measures that are inside of the, the shared savings program specifically. <laughs> that would certainly be susceptible to pharmacist influence. So there's, there's 23 measures in there overall, but they have two measures around readmissions reductions. So if we're thinking about what prevents uh, readmission, there is uh, a ton of literature that has established a clear correlation between medication adherence, post-discharge, and readmission within 30 days. So some research that I've seen has suggested that the association between a control group and those that are receiving interventions that help them be adherent can be as, as high as a, a factor of two, that you're twice as likely to be uh, admitted if you're not adherent. Okay, so that's, that's one, uh, one area inside of the shared savings program uh, measure set that it, that, you can, that pharmacists can contribute to. But there's others that are uh, more explicit too. So for example, there's a measure on statin therapy for the prevention and treatment of cardiovascular disease. There's uh, controlling high blood pressure, which often managed with diet, exercise, and appropriate pharmacotherapy. And then uh, there's also a measure around diabetes, HbA1c uh, control, ensuring that it's uh, less than nine. I actually, I think the measure characterizes it greater than nine, but you get the point. So those are just a handful of measures. And as we were talking about, like this, these therapeutic areas that we could be focusing on, well, of course, statin therapy and hypertension are managed with, these are parts of cardiovascular disease. Those are extremely sensitive to pharmacist intervention. 
And there are also areas of high importance for entities like accountable care organizations that are looking to improve on these measures and make sure that they're able to uh, to share in this shared savings program. But that's just a start. So I mean, there's if so if I were a pharmacist, I'd be raising my hand and thinking about you know how do I get involved in um, where is the need one, and uh, and then figuring out what it is that you can position yourself to meet that. Thanks, Sam. We don't need to rehash some of the numbers about impact for cardiovascular disease. And we did that a little bit with Lucy in, in a couple episodes ago. We did that with Prashanth in our last or latest episode. As you're going through, and, and Sam, you list three or four different programs, and you talked hospital readmissions. You talked about impact for, for patient care, statin therapy, high blood. The focus is pharmacologic management, and that being the major player. When we look at prevalence of disease and highest uh, causes for readmission, it's all tied to cardiovascular disease from that standpoint, right? So, you know, when we t think about this topic and how can pharmacy get involved, you said it very plainly, it's raise the hand, get involved with the game, get involved with the players. I, do, uh, Sam, a quick question for you related to this. Um, what, what do you think is the importance of pharmacy understanding some of the quality measures for, for some of these key disease states before they go to their local ACO or local health plan? is Do they need to have a hands-on knowledge about those items before and understanding, hey, we can help you improve this measure by X percent? Or is it important that they just have an action plan about how they take care of those patients? Curious if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, I think it's all about being persuasive. And uh, to your to your point, like, do you need to know everything to be persuasive? No, but it the more you know, the more persuasive you can be. Now, uh, the nice thing about uh, all of these measures is they're, they're public domain. I mean, one of the best places to hide anything on the internet is the CMS webpage. But, <laughs> but you, can log, you can go on there and actually pull down the performance of an ACO on each one of these measures that's right in your backyard. So if you know that they're struggling to say, you know, improve their annual flu vaccine or um, that they're that they're not doing great on depression remission at 12 months or that their tobacco use screening and cessation interventions are uh, you know floundering and that they need to get those rates up. I mean, those are just a couple of other measures that they have that you could potentially partner with them on to, to get them to goal. So because it's publicly available data, you can you can just go ahead and pull it and, and bring it with you. And, and the same holds true for really a lot of the other opportunities that are available for pharmacists. Like if you if you want to tie the profession in to, to any of these measurement sets, it, it all starts with uh, a, a baseline knowledge of what those measures are and what it is that you can be doing to contribute to them. Thanks for that additional description, Sam. We're going to move on to our third question, and pharmacy and medication use are still getting used to quality measurement in healthcare. You gave some of that in your background. In other, other healthcare sectors, quality improvement has been used for 30 plus years. There's been established quality measures for quite some time. So it does mean pharmacy and pharmacists, we've got a little bit of catching up to do in understanding those measures and understanding that value proposition. Um, I do want to hear from you and from your perspective, from your familiarity of quality measures, how does pharmacy as a profession, how do we get more involved? Are there areas where we need to be kind of more familiar with the data? Is there areas where we need to be better about the documentation and showing our value proposition? Would uh, like to open up that question for you. Yeah, it's a great question. So getting used to this idea of what it means to, to be a provider in, uh, under provider status, like what is that going to mean for our profession? Well, I can tell you unequivocally that in our era, accountability as a provider means being measured. So if we're going to embrace this idea and uh, put our hands in the air, air and say, yes, we want to be providers, we need to be prepared to embrace that uh, concept and to position ourselves proactively to go after. So we, we've done that in the community setting. And I, I mean, I would applaud PQS for uh, all the great work that you've you've done and putting together a dashboard that is ubiquitous. Like there's, I think it's 95% of pharmacies that have it. Um, and so many health plans that are using this as a commonly held tool for us to make sure that we're speaking the same language and focusing on uh, measures together with other healthcare entities. Now there's, this is exactly what we should be doing in other spaces. So it's, 
it's not only health plans that we could prospectively be working with as community pharmacies. Uh, community pharmacies should be looking to connect on the measures that matter to, to other entities as well and figuring out what those best practices that can tie together ACOs or, uh, or health systems like inpatient psychiatric facilities have follow-up measures as well. And keeping behavioral health, patients with behavioral health conditions uh, on their medications and if they're going into an inpatient psychiatric facility, they're probably supposed to be coming out with a, a psychiatric medication on board. But keeping them engaged is remarkably challenging, and um, a lot of patients are lost to follow up. So uh, there is a follow up measure making uh, for inpatient psych, and getting them plugged into the community and appropriately uh, on medications to help them work through and uh, achieve remission and um, and recovery as appropriate for behavioral health conditions is one a huge way that pharmacists can help out. But those dashboards need to be created. Uh, so that, that success story that we have between Part C and D plans especially and community pharmacy needs to be replicated, not only between community pharmacy and all of these other measure sets, but also other areas of pharmacy. So like health systems pharmacists, like what can health systems pharmacists be doing in their respective settings, um, using data to inform decisions, especially in real time, to help support patients and to improve the, the measures that matter for those given health systems. And, uh, other care settings. And more expansion, more availability for providers to be involved. That's going to be a huge part of this, Sam. And uh, as you stated with some of the different measures and activity, I would also call out that it, it notes the necessity for having some measures that are process-based measures, some measures that are outcome-based measures. And it does need to be a, a mix that's there, right? Um, if you're only having outcomes-based measures, but nothing that's looking at kind of initial steps or what actions are taken. It doesn't help tell the full story on uh, who is doing what. So those do those items do really need to go hand in hand for us to be successful long term. Now, Sam, I do want to thank you for sharing your expertise today about quality measures, about the healthcare landscape. And our focus for today's episode, we thought, hey, let's talk about quality measures. Let's talk about cardiovascular disease, how this all ties together. And you know, with that second question, we we did hit on that quite a bit. And really, I think the focus, if I'm summarizing it here for everyone, there's a number of different measures related to cardiovascular disease, whether it's the pharmacologic uh, management of patients, which Sam stated very clearly, that is the role of the pharmacist. We can have a role to play uh, in that area. Uh, when it does come to treatment, uh, hospital readmissions, reducing those readmissions, uh, there's a number of ways in which pharmacy can have an opportunity to improve patient health outcomes. And really, it comes down to, with your pharmacy practice, what is it that you're prioritizing and how do you specifically work with your local providers, your local ACO, your local insurance plan, et cetera, to focus on that care for patients? That's kind of a long way of saying that there's no right or wrong answer. There's many answers for how pharmacists can get involved with quality measurement and cardiovascular measures, but that's gonna be up to the determination for, for you and your pharmacy team and how you best serve patients. Now, before we do close, uh, Sam, we do always like to end with a bit of a fun question. And I know from your experience, you have you have done quite a bit of travel across the world. I know in your, uh, in your time you've spent, you've had some experience speaking a number of different languages. And uh, that has to add a unique perspective uh, in many different ways. Uh, you are a healthcare provider and you've made a successful career with that, but was curious to hear how your thoughts and traveling the world and your experience with being multilingual uh, has shaped your career as a pharmacist. So I'll, I'll, I'll open it up here for your thoughts. Uh, Nick, that is a pretty fun question. Um, I, like you, love to travel. I uh, have had some really great opportunities to see some cool parts of the world. Wow. I think probably the, the way that it's influenced it the most is just the appreciation of just how different places can be and um, what different mindsets people can have about the provision of healthcare. Uh, it certainly has prompted me to look at other health systems and try to come up with ideas for ways that we could potentially modify the patchwork quilt that we of a healthcare system that we we have and some of the unique features of it, both the pros and cons of it, especially in light of countries that we we know are, are, are doing well and how we can replicate some of their success stories here at home. You know, I did want to touch on something else that you said there too, though, Nick. Sure. Uh, 
if if you don't mind before we close. No, go for it, Sam. Like, I, I really liked how you characterized this need to have um, a mix of measures involved. And it's really just uh, a, a feature of risk, again. Like if you're like uh, if you're a in the looking at something in the crawl, walk, run sort of staging of ability to tackle healthcare quality measures, like yeah, outcomes measures are where you want to get when you're running full speed, but structure and process measures are definitely not a bad way to get you there. And certainly having an appropriate mix uh, as you're assuming more risk is is a great idea. And what we're seeing inside of a lot of these measurement sets, especially as it pertains to heart health, cardiovascular disease, controlling high blood pressure and the like, is that there's a pretty good stack of going from process to intermediate outcome to outcome. So SSP is a great example. The two readmission measures, um, they're going to be looking at reasons that people are coming in. So many of those reasons are associated with cardiovascular issues like heart failure, acute myocardial infarction, and the like. Um, but then we have these measures around uh, intermediate outcomes like controlling high blood pressure uh, that are also included in the set. Um, but we'll see a lot of process measures around medication management included as well, just to make sure that people are um, using those evidence-based practices that we know influence outcomes. So uh, you couldn't be more right, Nick. Those are uh, precisely the sorts of things that we need to have a good, healthy mix and that um, certainly the pendulum has swung really hard in favor of having more outcomes measures since those are definitely uh, things that encourage innovation and figuring out how to solve problems when you characterize it explicitly in terms of what the problem is. But nothing wrong with having measures around best practices to get you there. Yeah, it's a, you, you need to cover the the whole experience there. It's an important aspect of it. And Sam, I, I appreciate you circling back to that point. It's certainly a favorite topic of mine when it comes to quality measurement. So I love that you're able to throw it in here at the end. Uh, Sam, with that uh, final item, if our listeners are interested in hearing more from you or if they want to hear more about what NQF does, how can they uh, reach out to you? How, what's the best way to get in contact? Yeah, thanks. Um, you can reach out to me over an email. Uh, it's pretty simple, samuel.stolpe at gmail.com. <laughs> or uh, find me on LinkedIn, um, Sam Stolpe. I've got a fairly unique last name. Pretty easy to find me. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Sam, thank you very much again. Appreciate having you here on the show and for sharing your, your knowledge today. Oh, and pleasant, Nick. Thanks. Absolutely. Thank you. So this does now wrap up our series for February, focusing on Heart Health Month. And we, of course, made sure to hit our quality measures today. For our listeners, please tune in next week at as this month of March. Uh, we'll be bringing some great new guests, both locally nationally and internationally. So how about that for a teaser? Uh, I, I do hope you subscribe to our podcast so you, so that you don't miss an episode of the Quality Corner Show. If you have questions or have a, you have a topic that you would like to hear us discuss, please let us know. If you would like to come on the show and talk about a topic, please let us know about that as well. You can contact us at info at pharmacyquality.com or you can message us directly on LinkedIn or Twitter. And with that, I again appreciate you listening to the Quality Corner Show, and there is one final message from the PQS team. The Pharmacy Quality Solutions Quality Corner Show has a request for you. Our goal is to spread the word about how quality measurement can help improve health outcomes, and we need your help in sharing this podcast to friends and colleagues in the healthcare industry. We also want you to provide feedback, ask us questions, and suggest health topics you'd like to see covered. If you are a health expert and you want to contribute to the show or even talk on the show, please contact us. You can email info at pharmacyquality.com. Let us know what is on your mind, what we can address so that you are fully informed. We want you to be able to provide the best care for your patients and members, and we wish all of you listeners out there well.